Coming up today, President Park Geun-hye is in Kenya to promote trade and business with the East African powerhouse. She'll hold summit talks with her Kenyan counterpart on Tuesday. South Korea is closely tracking any signs of a possible ballistic missile launch by North Korea. Japanese media had reported that a launch might be imminent. First, a committee that will prepare a foundation for the victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery is set for its first meeting in Seoul. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday, May 31st here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We are going to start with the president's tour of East Africa now into its final leg. President Park Geun-hye has arrived in Kenya, the biggest economy in the region. She'll hold summit talks with her Kenyan counterpart later on this Tuesday. Our Song Jason, who is travelling with the president, reports from Nairobi. Kenya, the largest economy in East Africa, is also Korea's biggest trading partner in the region. Kenya is vying to emerge as a new industrial nation with its vision 2030 for growth, and President Park's visit to Nairobi will be focused on laying a foundation for Korean businesses to enter East Africa. The president is being accompanied by the biggest business delegation during her journey in Africa, with over 90 Korean companies represented. Kenya, the last stop of the president's Africa tour, is the center of transportation and logistics in East Africa, leading economic growth in the region. The Kenya visit will also bridge relations with neighboring countries in East Africa. The two countries are expected to strengthen bilateral ties by enhancing their relations and deepening the connections between them. President Bak's visit is also historic in that her counterpart, Uhuru Kenyatta, is the son of Kenya's first president, Jomo Kenyatta, who established diplomatic relations with President Park's father, Park Jong-hee, in 1964. At the time, Nairobi also thanked Korea for immediately recognizing its independence in 1963. President Park has a full day ahead with a summit followed by a business forum and a cultural event. She'll also check how the Korea Aid Development Program will run in Kenya and stop by the UN office here in Nairobi, which is the United Nations headquarters in Africa. Song Jisun, Arirang News, Nairobi. Now, ahead of her arrival in Kenya, President Park Geun-hye expressed hopes for mutual prosperity with the East African nation. She pointed out how Korea's development experience and Kenya's potential could make good relations beneficial to both sides. Oh Jong-hee reports. Adding new chapters of success story through a shared vision of mutual prosperity. That's what President Park Geun-hye emphasized in an op-ed she contributed to Kenya's Daily Nation newspaper on Monday. Kenya is President Park's third and final stop in Africa, and before arriving there, she made sure to send her congratulations on Madaraka Day, which marks Kenya's return to self-rule in 1963. In her piece, the president said that Koreans can relate to the emotions Kenyans hold as both have endured colonial rule. Also, she said that the two countries are similar in that they are known for diligence and zeal for education and have embraced the market economy. She emphasized that these common features are a good foundation for friendly and cooperative relations. President Park also promised that Korea will become a reliable partner for Kenya's development and that harmonizing their respective experiences and potential would lead to a mutually beneficial partnership. She said that Kenya will be able to make an astonishing leap forward if Korea's development experience and know-how, internationally recognized as the miracle of Han River, are aptly shared. Pointing out that Kenyan exports have increased more than six-fold to become Korea's largest trading partner in East Africa, President Park said she hoped Korea's creative economy initiatives could also help boost Kenya's economic development moving forward. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. 
Now, before arriving in Kenya, President Park Geun-hye was in Uganda, and before she left that country, she celebrated the opening of a special institute. It's designed to invigorate rural parts of Uganda in a similar fashion to Korea's development in the 1970s. Ian Shin reports. President Park and Ugandan President Yuweri Museveni attended the opening ceremony of the National Farmers Leadership Center in the central district of Mpiji. Grounded in the teachings of Korea's model New Community Movement, or Semaurundong, the center will train Ugandans to contribute to the development of rural communities. <laughs> The Semar Undung movement is a political initiative, first established by Park's late father, former President Park Jong Hee, during the 1970s, to enhance the Korean economy by modernizing rural areas. President Museveni expressed interest in incorporating the campaign during talks with President Park in Seoul in May 2013. He expects the movement will enhance Uganda's agricultural business, improve overall living standards, and help develop infrastructure such as roads, energy, and water. Area residents were also introduced to the humanitarian project Korea Aid, which provides health care, nutritional support, and cultural content. The aid program will continue to support the community using special vehicles to provide services once or twice a month. Yun Shin, Arirang News. Now, in other news, the South Korean military says it's monitoring movements in North Korea and is prepared for any situation. After Japanese media outlets reported Pyongyang may be gearing up for another ballistic missile launch, Japan's Kyodo News and NHK reports citing government sources in Tokyo that uh, Japan is on alert after detecting signs of a missile launch uh, preparations on North Korea's east coast and has issued an order to uh, intercept any possible missile launch. And that includes deploying Japan's uh, Aegis destroyers equipped with high performance radars along with ground based missile interception uh, units as well. According to Kyodo News, although it seems the regime is readying a Musudan type ballistic missile, it is unclear whether it will be fired anytime soon. North Korea carried out three Musidan missile launches last month, but all of them ended in failure. And as a follow-up to that story, UN agencies have revealed that they haven't received any additional reports of a possible missile launch from North Korea. The International Maritime Organization and the International Telecommunication Union say they have not been informed about any new moves by Pyongyang. The North told the agencies of its plans to launch a satellite in February, but did not tell them about a series of ballistic missile launches uh, that it attempted last month. North Korea is obliged to inform the two agencies as the organizations require all member states to report rocket or projectile launches. Now, South Korea had the honor on Monday of being the first Asian nation to host the UN NGO conference. It was also the last stop of UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon's six day visit to his home country. And Ban spoke about the future of sustainable development and also shared his personal goals and future plans. Gonsoa with the details. The role non-governmental organizations have to play in helping countries achieve the UN's sustainable development goals through education was underlined at the 66th UN NGO conference in the southern city of Gyeongju Monday. This year's UN NGO conference, with its long history, is even more significant as it's being held for the first time in Asia here in the Republic of Korea. In line with this year's theme, Education for Global Citizenship, United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon highlighted Korea as a successful example, citing its transformation from aid recipient to donor country. At a press conference following the opening ceremony, Pan fielded questions about his biggest achievement during his two terms as UN chief. If you ask me today something which I feel proud of, as I said in Jeju Forum, there are two 
very outstanding uh, visions and commitments the world has achieved and adopted. That is the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals with the 17 goals. The other one, he said, was climate change. Almost everybody in the world agrees that it was I, as a Secretary General, who really put this climate change in the high, the high in the international agenda. Pan also commented on speculation about his visit to Korea being linked to a possible presidential bid. I'm asking you to refrain from stretched interpretations of my actions in Korea. There are many assumptions and reports on what I'll do in the future, but let me just tell you that it's I myself who knows best what I'll be doing, and I'll be the one having to decide. Pan wrapped up his six-day trip to his home country on Monday to return to New York amid lingering questions about what he will do after his term. But he told reporters that for now he is solely focused on successfully wrapping up his term as UN Secretary General, which ends exactly seven months from now. Kwon Soa, Arirang News, Gyeongju. Now in domestic politics, the 20th National Assembly kicked off its four-year term on Monday. All three of Korea's major political parties have vowed to work hard to make the legislative process much smoother than the previous parliament. Our political correspondent Park ji -won with the details. In a general meeting of its lawmakers, the ruling Senuri party confirmed the appointment of Kim Hee-ho as its new interim leader. Kim, a former justice and the former chairman of the Government Public Ethics Committee, will serve until the party convention in July. He said he will do his best to end the party's long-standing factional feuds, which caused the party its parliamentary majority in April's general election. We plan to revamp party regulations so the party can officially and sternly punish members who attempt to harm the party's unity by engaging in negative factional activities. The main opposition Minju Party of Korea, now the largest party in the new assembly, vowed to focus on the economy. Interim leader Kim Jong-in, who will serve in his position until the party convention in late August, asked lawmakers not to become mired in partisan strife, but to focus on solving livelihood issues. The party's floor leader delivered a similar message. We expect the efforts and activities of the 123 lawmakers gathered here will become a new source of hope for the people as well as living proof of hope in Korea by giving people the notion that you are always there for them. The minor opposition People's Party also vowed to make the 20th Assembly different from the previous one by focusing on making a more productive parliament. The 20th Assembly should be a conscientious parliament that can solve and improve people's livelihoods. And the People's Party should lead the way. We need to offer a vision for reviving the economy and initiate policies that can help us realize that vision. Meanwhile, the deputy floor leaders of the main three parties began negotiations on filling key parliamentary posts, such as assembly speaker and the chairmen of the standing committees, so the assembly can get started as soon as possible. Park ji -won, Arirang News. Now, five months after Seoul and Tokyo reached a landmark deal on the wartime sex slavery issue, Korea is launching a preparatory committee to lay the groundwork for a foundation that is part of the historic deal. Connie Kim reports. A preparatory committee tasked with establishing a foundation for victims of wartime sexual slavery will launch Tuesday. It's a first step toward implementation of a landmark settlement on wartime sexual slavery reached in December. Under the agreement, Seoul and Tokyo had agreed to set up the foundation with the Japanese government promising to contribute 1 billion yen or 9.1 million U.S. dollars. Seoul's foreign ministry said in a joint statement release with the Gender Equality Ministry on Monday that the first meeting will take place Tuesday with 11 members. The committee is expected to discuss the future direction of the foundation and will prepare to launch the foundation as early as next month. 
Foundation of Reconciliation and Healing is currently being considered as a name in order to reflect the voices of sexual slavery victims. Although preparations for the foundation are already underway, Seoul still has a number of unfinished tasks to deal with first. Japan has been asking to remove the Comfort Women statue from its place outside the Japanese embassy in Seoul, though Korea says that, that was never part of the deal. Meanwhile, advocacy groups in Seoul have been calling for a complete renegotiation of the deal, saying the government must not ignore the voices of the surviving comfort women. Four of the women have passed away since the deal was reached, and there are now just 42 remaining survivors. The groups say not all of the women agree with the deal, and many of them are calling for a sincere apology from the Japanese government. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Korean shipbuilder Hyundai Merchant Marine could soon clear a major hurdle in its quest to reform the company and resume uh, normal functions, Hwang Ho-jun reports. Hyundai Merchant Marine may be close to reaching a deal with its ship owners to cut leasing rates for its charter ships. The financially troubled shipper's main creditor, Korea Development Bank, said the deal could be final in the next few days. If that's the case, Hyundai merchants' bondholders are likely to agree to roll over more than 670 million U.S. dollars of their debt. Financial Services Commission Chairman Yim Jong-yong said Monday that the shipper and the ship owners are continuing to narrow differences on details of the rate cut. Some experts in Korea have suggested the ship owners recognize reaching a deal with Korea's number two shipper to reduce leasing rates would ultimately be in their favor as well. Last year, Hyundai Merchant paid 1.6 billion U.S. dollars in leasing fees. The shipper initially sought a rate cut around 30 percent, but experts now say that's highly unlikely. But even with a rate cut of 20 percent, the Korean shipping company will be able to save 120 million U.S. dollars a year. If the shipping company and ship owners are able to reach a deal, many challenges still lie ahead for Hyundai Merchant to get the company back on track. Hyundai Merchant's performance won't necessarily improve just because of a rate cut. More needs to be done, such as improving production cost and stronger restructuring within the company. Hyundai Merchant will also seek assistance to join a new global shipping alliance that Korea's largest shipper, Hanjin, successfully joined last week. Hwang Ho-jun, Arirang News. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you, as always, for watching. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts on next scheduled bulletin coming up at 10 a.m. Korea time. So until then, goodbye.